talk about business agility. And my session topic today, uh, just give me a minute, let me adjust my screen here. And there we go. So today we'll talk about uh, my session today, which is titled Pause Then Pivot, a guide to leveraging agile for better business decisions. Now, um, Agile tends to operate in waves. Uh, for all of us who've been part of the Agile community over the last 10 years, we've seen certain cycles come and go based on the demands of the day. For instance, about uh, you know, seven, eight years ago, there used to be a lot of conversation around scaling Agile because that was the challenge of the day once Agile had been introduced by a scrum on the team level. Soon after, about five years ago, was the age of DevOps where we started to think about uh, how do we ensure that uh, we are able to deliver faster, even if we're designing better and iteratively, we are developing and implementing better iteratively, how do we ensure that agility expands over to release and operations as well? And now firmly over the last three to four years, the conversation has shifted towards business agility. That is how do we make sure that we leverage the benefits of agile not just within the delivery and implementation of software, but actually the end-to-end -end delivery of products and services. So today we're going to talk about business agility. Now, when we began this journey, the promises of business agility have been quite appealing. For instance, uh, the first thing that uh, came to fore is the fact that it's based on empiricism. The fact that we use data and metrics to optimize our delivery process and we ensure that we are more objective in taking decisions with respect to our products as opposed to uh, uh, relying on the subjective approach of various experts. Uh, additionally, uh, it was the promise of collaboration that is business and IT work together daily to uh, develop better outcomes and achieve better outcomes. Uh, it was also adaptability that we respond to changing market requirements very, very quickly. It was productivity that we measure and we focus on improving our throughput, we remove impediments, we find where our bottlenecks are, we optimize the process and our value stream entirely. Uh, frequent and early delivery that we design, develop and release in very tightly bound iterations. And we ensure that there's no gap in between, we ensure that we build incrementally. And then high customer satisfaction. We demonstrate outcomes and receive feedback from our customers very regularly. And therefore, uh, we uh, do not run the risk of going off track uh, significantly. Now, these were the promises of business agility, which were excellent, absolutely wonderful, uh, and designed to tackle the challenges of the day. But now if we look back at the state of most organizations uh, attempting to make their business more agile, this is the reality on the ground. That is, yes, we do use data and metrics to optimize our delivery process, but we don't leverage user analytics to make current decisions. For instance, we are adaptable, we respond to changing needs, but we react and we're rarely able to anticipate those challenges. We do have frequent and early delivery, but our enabling functions, finance, legal, marketing, need more time to plan major releases, and we are often held back because of that. Collaboration, business and IT do work together daily. We have a cross-functional Trump team with representation from business and IT works. Uh, but uh, through representatives with limited ownership and authority, which only creates approval cycles heading back into business and IT, and uh, those functions don't necessarily speak the same language. While business may speak in terms of cost per feature, IT continues to talk in terms of velocity. And it appears as if they're operating on different goals, even if they're actually the same, because the language is not the same. Uh, productivity, yes, we do address bottlenecks, we find impediments, we do our value stream mapping, we look at um, what our bottlenecks are. But we frequently invest time and effort in building the wrong features or initiatives that are ultimately discarded. So we build the wrong thing very, very effectively and efficiently. And then finally, for customer satisfaction, we demonstrate outcomes and we receive feedback from customers frequently. We absolutely do that. But we cater to such a large demographic of, um, uh, of people that it's difficult to account for how they would react to certain features. And we simply do not go into that in-depth analysis. Right. And this is what holds us back in terms of really unlocking the full benefit of business agility. Now, well, it, can be, it can be difficult to gauge where we are when it comes to unlocking the full benefits of org agility. 
and uh, knowing where the problem lies, knowing do we need help? Are we, are we in a good place? Are we in a bad place? Where to start? And the idea is to keep things very simple. There are really only four questions that you need to ask yourself to gauge where you are when it comes to business agility. The first question is early release. Right, that's the rudimentary basic. Do all teams regularly, that is at least once per month, produce value for your customers by a fully integrated and tangible deliverable? But fully integrated here is really important, right? The second question is feedback loop. Are the outcomes, that is user analytics, feedback metrics of a product iteration, they regularly used to refine subsequent versions. That is when you achieve an outcome for a particular iteration, for a sprint, for a cycle, and you take it to production, you release it. Do you actually see how those features have performed and use that information to further refine your backlog, feed into what your next iteration is going to be like? The third question is speed of decision-making. Whenever any critical product decisions are to be made quickly, right? are they done in a matter of hours and days, or are they done in a matter of weeks or months and with relative ease? Right? That's a good signifier for how agile your business is. And then finally, the fourth question is trial tolerance. Is experimentation actively encouraged? Is it embedded within the culture, policies, and practices of your organization? Or do you see that there is a certain resistance or risk aversion uh, that prevents uh, organizations or teams, your, your people, from experimenting and trying out new ideas? Right. Uh, in general, there are the four questions that you should ask yourself, no matter which organization, industry, or role you are in. It's important to ask yourself these four questions and then start from there, right? So in that uh, same uh, spirit, what we'll do right now is I'd like you to think about your own context, think about your organization, the team you're operating in, and ask yourself these questions. Are we releasing early and integrating early? Are we bringing tangible deliverables to our customers at least once a month? Are we completing the food feedback loop? Are we measuring the performance of features we're delivering to refine subsequent versions of our product? Are we making decisions faster or slower? Do we have trial questions? So let's gather some insights now. I'd like you all to please open Menti in your browser. So please go to menti.com or if you have the Menti app on your phone, you can use that too. And please enter this code or you can use this QR code. There's also a link pasted in the chat. So many ways to go to Menti, but I would really like it if you could join me on Menti and let's see where we are collectively in terms of some of the, these parameters. I'll give you all a couple of minutes. Please open Menti. Please open the app or own in your browser. Please enter this code. You can also use this QR code to reach the website. Um, and there's a link in the chat as well. We only have one person here. And we have the first question, which is how would you rate your organization of business agility? And please keep those four parameters that we discussed in mind. How would you rate your organization? Is it low? Is it moderate? Is it high? We have three people here so far. I'm expecting more answers. Please do use Menti and join in. Go to Menti, use this code, or use this link. Great, we have more answers coming in. Hi, that's excellent. All right, seven people. Be having a slight delay, Sherry. So uh, I've just put on a reminder on the chat. Everybody, kindly look into the link, and uh, you can use the code that's on the chat too to directly access this. Sounds good. Great. We have nine votes in. Leaning towards moderate with a few people. Thirty percent representation of a high level of business agility, which is excellent. And I'm very excited to hear from people, especially who rate uh, things on the higher side uh, for, uh, for how they engage with the session. So that would be really excellent. Great, we have 10 votes in. So let's call it now. Uh, how would you rate your organization of business agility of the participants we have who've joined us on Menti? 70% uh, rate it as moderate. 
and 30% to date to this house. So definitely some work has been done in terms of laying the foundations for agility. No one says it's slow, but then there's much to be done to bridge the gap between this and this, right? So now the next question that we come to is what do you consider the primary area of improvement within your organization towards enhancing business agility? Is it that it's data-driven product decisions or adaptability to changing requirements or frequency of delivery, collaboration between business and IT, productivity, customer centricity, or all of the above? And bear in mind, it could be many things here, but what is the primary area of improvement within your organization? Customer centricity, coming out on top, three votes in so far. All of the above. Five votes in, six. Seven, all right, data driven product decisions. So we're starting to see a pretty even spread, which is interesting. An almost even spread. Uh, so a few more words, they were 10 towards the last. I'm hoping the remaining three participants also have some thoughts to share here. All right. Data driven product decisions coming out on top now. All right, let's call it. So we're seeing a pretty even spread along these challenges that yes, data-driven product development and using and leveraging data to gauge the performance of features and use that to make better product decisions is something that is a very key part that is missing. We've managed to optimize locally wherein we are developing iteratively, we're releasing iteratively, but we're not always using the insights and using the benefits of actually delivering iteratively to decide where our product goes next, which is very interesting because uh, you know there's only certain gains to be leveraged by optimizing our delivery, making it very efficient, but not closing this loop of feedback really increases the chances of us very efficiently, very wonderfully, very effectively, and with high predictability, uh, delivering a feature that is not really the right feature. Right. So that's a cause for concern. Now coming in second is collaboration between business and IT. Uh, there is customer centricity. That is also a big factor. And then adaptability to changing requirements, frequency of delivery, and one person says all of the above. So pretty even spread, right? Which is interesting, which is interesting that we know that this, this is the primary area that really requires focus at this point of time in most organizations that started out with using Asia. So now thank you everyone for your inputs and insights on Menti. I will now go back to the presentation and ask you to come back to uh, come back to the presentation on uh, Zoom, and we will continue. So we learned how would you rate your business agility? Most votes go to moderate. We learned that in terms of these areas, there's a pretty even spread with data-driven product decisions coming out on top. Right. So how do we fix the situation? Where do we go next when it comes to enhancing business agility? Right. Now, we have to start with the foundations, and most of the items that I'll talk about on this slide is something that most of your organizations would either already be catering to or should be very high up on your agenda, because this is the obvious stuff. This is the bare bones basics, right? Starting with empowerment. Yes, you need your product owners to have authority to take decisions. They should be in a position where they don't have to go back to a large uh, you know, set of functions and approval cycles to take any decision regarding the product that they technically are supposed to own. Then uh, to build communities of practice, encourage experimentation, learn from fast and controlled failure, build a culture, especially within product owners and a community of practice for product owners to encourage experimentation and data-driven decisions. And then true self-organization and cross-functionality. So ordinarily what we tend to do is that when we are building cross-functional teams, we pick up certain skills, right? We pick up a business analyst, designer, product owner, we have a few developers, testers, release specialists, et cetera, put them together in a team. And then we call it a cross-functional team, we call that a standard scrum team. And then we say, great, we now have a self-organizing cross-functional team that can release from end to end. But then there are certain rules that sit on the periphery that have great ramifications, right? So for instance, if there is a product owner that is not fully empowered to take decisions within the team, um, it may have a lot of stakeholders that they funnel information from and take decisions for and on behalf of. 
But if the decisions are taken away from the team and not by the product owner, it tends to create these cycles of approval and the possibility of working on a sprint outcome or migration outcome that is not as expected goes exponentially higher. Another example of this role might be architecture. So we have many instances where uh, we have a scrum team that technically on paper in theory is empowered to take its own decisions, but there is an architectural review board or a set of um, you know, enterprise architects set outside the team uh, actually must approve every decision taken by the team, but are not an active member of the scrum team, which limits the team's cross functionality and ability to take decisions, right? Uh, a general rule, rule of thumb is for any role, whether it's an architect, whether it's someone in you know, data warehousing, whether any specialized role, uh, if that role is necessary to achieve outcomes, make decisions, when delivering uh, any outcomes for an iteration for a product, then that person should be within the team, should be a dedicated member of that company. However, if a person is a subject matter expert who is being a consulted, who's an advisor to the team, then they can only operate in that capacity and give advice when they are called on and consulted, but they do not make decisions on behalf of the team. The anti-pattern they must be very careful about is that there is a person who is not dedicated to the team, sits outside the team and has specialized area as that is necessary for any deliverable to actually achieve its outcomes. Right? The second very basic rudimentary area is around product design. Now, we absolutely must incorporate user analytics and product backup management process. There is no excuse today. There is such a wide range of products available to really gauge how features are performing. What are our top 10 features? What are the ones that engage customers most? Which are the ones that are least used? Oh, what demographics or what cohorts based on, say, geography, age, et cetera, what features are the most popular? Analytics like that, there's absolutely no reason to operate without that information at this point of time. There are so many tools available and they're so developed and advanced at this point of time. that it is, if you're not doing it right now, you're missing a critical tool in your product management process, right? Then establish a community of product owners and make metrics and analytics accessible. Uh, accessible, I would say to a radical degree. Ensure that when you're measuring analytics for your product, ensure that those are very easily visible and accessible to your entire organization, and particularly the team that is concerned with the product. Um, because uh, we can only improve what we are measuring. So it's extremely important to make those accessible. Then make market research a core responsibility for product owners. And this must be reinforced in the community as well. Because we can no longer be in a situation where whenever changes arise, whether it's regulatory in nature, whether it's market dynamics or competition, that we react to that change and we work towards reacting effectively to that change, but we do not make any effort towards predicting it. So it's extremely important to do that. And therefore, that market research should be a core responsibility for all product owners, right? Ensure short iterations, measure lead and cycle times, optimize the efficiency of your value stream, measure where your wait time lies in your entire product or service delivery life cycle from start to end. Where are you waiting for approvals? Where are you waiting for some action to happen? What is the wait time? And work radically to get rid of that, to ensure that your iterations are short and you're able to utilize data from those iterations to further improve further versions of your product, right? And then the third very obvious thing is introduce Asia to your supporting functions, to finance, to legal, to HR, to marketing, and you automate, digitize, and scale. Whatever you cannot automate, you digitize, and then you scale, right? And uh, weed out those inefficiencies so that your bottlenecks don't lie in a function uh, where simply Asia isn't present and they're accustomed to say, uh, you know, release once a year or once in six months and simply can't cope with the uh, due diligence required for it. Agile must be introduced across your organization, especially when you're trying to broach that, uh, you know, end-to-end -end agility problem. Now, coming to, you know, we've gotten the basics out of the way. These were the basics and the foundations that most organizations in some capacity are already addressing. And if they're not, then it's high time you did. Um, but then now we talk about taking it to the next level. What does it mean to close the remaining gaps in agility, right? Uh, the first thing that I would talk about, which we really don't speak about enough in my uh, experience, is building a diverse team, right? Um, the key to a good product 
is ensuring we make the right business decisions. And the more similar our team is, the more similar the people working on the product are, the more likely it is that they have blind spots or overlap, right? So the best that you can do, especially in your product design, product development um, functions, is to ensure that you have a very diverse team, diverse in terms of their education, diverse in terms of their background, geography, levels of experience, et cetera. And that will allow you to make sure you have a solid foundation for making better decisions in your team because people tend to catch problems that are different and have different blind spots. And if we as a team are very diverse, come from a very different set of experiences, we are more likely to spot something that our team member may have missed, right? That's the basic, that's what it starts with. Then the second thing that we have is goal alignment at every level. Uh, when we uh, try to scale Agile from the ground up, wherein we start with teams and move forward, uh, the key challenge that tends to occur is once we reach the middle management, program management, portfolio management situation, uh, there can be some resistance because there is a sense that the goals are different, that the goals in this case of the Agile transformation function or of IT is different from what business wants. But in reality, Agile is only the means to an end. It is only a tool that we're using to achieve better business outcomes. So it must be made extremely clear that goal alignment is present on every level, that business and IT want the same things when it comes to Agile. What are those things? What are those metrics? What are those KPIs? What are those outcomes? What is the vision? Right. So that goal alignment is extremely important. Then uh, shifting decision structures. We've, you know, a lot has been said about decentralization, delegation, autonomy in agile teams, where we don't want a situation where we have um, uh, teams that are operating at the ground level. And then there is a hierarchical structure where every decision has to per percolate up the hierarchy and come down the hierarchy for it to be taken. We want to ensure that we decentralize decision making by dividing decisions things that have major ramifications for the entire organization, maybe we keep them slightly centralized. The things that uh, only operate on the program level, we start to decentralize them. And for the teams that are affected, the day-to-day -day working of the team or a single iteration, we keep those decisions firmly within the team, uh, wedged on the belief that the people who are actually doing the work on a day-to-day -day basis are the most equipped to take the decisions about it, right? And then early prototyping. And when we say early prototyping, we're talking about very, very, very early. So um, to say that, it would not be an exaggeration to say that if you're building a piece of software with a final deliverable, then if your MVP is in the form of that same, um, that same outcome, in the form of software, it's probably too late for your prototype. In fact, your first prototype should not be software. Your first prototype should be maybe um, an envision uh, diagram. Maybe it should be uh, existing in a different tangible form for the end users and representatives of end users to interact with it so that you can test your hypothesis early. And this is where I urge everyone to think about design thinking principles and do some research in that area because uh, it is a body of knowledge that does walk you through the various ways in which you can do wireframing better, you can do prototyping better, how do you build prototypes that are responsive in nature, use certain tools like Envision or Sketch or others to ensure that your first version of a product that tests your hypotheses around product design and what your customers want uh, can be tested as quickly as possible, right? Then meaningful and visible metrics. We avoid vanity metrics. We ensure that we have radical transparency. We are very clear about what we want to measure. We do some research. Um, whenever any product backlog item or feature is being defined, uh, then measuring how the performance of that feature should be measured should very much be part of the acceptance criteria. Right? We should very, be very clear about how the performance of a feature will be measured once it is in production. Right, while we're defining that feature. And being very careful, and it's an art, it's really an art finding the right metrics and avoiding vanity metrics. There are situations where uh, you know, we might be tempted to measure the uh, number of users who signed up for a particular service, uh, but we fail to measure the users that are actively engaged on a monthly basis. Or we measure the people who've clicked on a particular function but we don't see where they dropped off in our entire workflows. It's, there's a whole uh, set of, um, there's a set of uh, best practices around defining uh, actionable metrics and avoiding vanity metrics, which I strongly encourage all product owners 
and all product management, product design people to have a look at for sure. And then there is closing the learning loop, which is that we must absolutely operate in cycles wherein we build something, we measure how it's performing, we learn the outcomes, and then we use those outcomes to repeat the cycle. Right? So closing that loop using user analytics is extremely important. Uh, automate what you can, digitize what you cannot, fairly obvious, and then dynamic budgeting. Now, this is the part that really a lot of organizations get wrong. That even though we have accepted the fact during implementation that our customers may want different things, the market may change, our competition may drive us to make different decisions. However, we tend to fund our initiatives in a very traditional way very often. That is, once a year we decide what our budgets are going to be and how they're allocated. And irrespective of what happens during that year, our budgets stay static which is really not acceptable at this point of time, because if we have accepted the fact in product delivery and design that we will respond to customer requirements, we may start out our year with a portfolio of products wherein some are expected to perform a certain way versus the others, and then market conditions change how that happens, then dynamic budgeting should also account for that. And resources should also be allocated to the products that are performing best and performing very well, as opposed to continuing to push money into a money pit. Right. So dynamic budgeting is something that must also catch up and that is their uh, work with our finance team becomes really important. Right. Now, this is all well and good, right? We've talked about a few aspects about laying the foundations and then you know, enhancing them with some of the common missing gaps in business ability. But now that, uh, let's imagine we're well in Asia, right? We know what to do, we've accomplished all of this. What is the end goal here? What is it that we are doing next? And the truth is it's very simple. We are preparing for a very exciting, but a very unpredictable future. Uh, we live in an extremely exciting time, uh, even though, uh, I mean, uh, I can hardly overstate that given the situation we're in with COVID and the world changing so rapidly in the last couple of years. But uh, when I say an exciting future, it's that you may sense, and I'm sure all of us have had this experience personally, that technological innovation seems to be moving exponentially. The world is changing so much faster than it used to before. The amount of change in how you operate on a day-to-day -day basis interact with your environment, uh, the level to which it would change in about 50 years, it changes in less than 10 years today, right? And that feeling is not wrong. We've all felt it, we've all experienced it. The world is changing so rapidly, we barely know how to keep up. You're not wrong, you're very right about it. So let me walk you through a few graphs that, uh, that posit how this is happening. So while this is referring to US households, it's demonstrating, this graph is demonstrating how consumption of any product or technology spreads so much faster today than it did before. You're seeing a graph where on the x-axis, you have a timeline starting from the 1900s to 2005, and then on the y-axis, you're seeing percentage of adoption in households. And what you see is that with the earlier technologies like telephone, electricity, radio, refrigerator, the rate of adoption is spread over such a large period of time because it would move slowly. On the other hand, if you look at the last 20 years, VCR, cell phones, computer, internet, that rate of adoption has sped up so significantly that once a particular technology is, uh, is uh, initiated, once it's uh, developed, then it reaches people so much faster than it did before and becomes a universal standard so much faster than it did before. Now, this is not a very appealing graph, but it gets a lot of information across, which is that here on the x-axis, again, we're seeing through the centuries, major events um, and uh, essentially interventions of technological evolution. And you're seeing a timeline that extends up to the current time. And then on the y-axis, you're seeing world population. And what you're seeing is how things get compressed. Uh, major events that would change how we view the world regarding you know, industrial revolution, the steam engine, railroads, electrification, flying machines, they happened quite far apart in the timeline. On the other hand, in the last 100, 200 years, so much has happened. Synthet synthetic fibers, the polio vaccine, atomic bombs, Silicon Valley, World Wide Web, the Hubble telescope, mapping of the human genome, right? And things are really speeding up, really, really speeding up and certifiably, measurably, you can see this is exponential in nature. It's very rapid. Now, 
Also, this has another side to it, which is that if you see this graph from the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, you're seeing a timeline and you're seeing the uh, GDP per capita. And technology today, unfortunately, is widening the inequality through the ages, which is during the Industrial Revolution, the gap between GDP in countries that were leading the front versus uh, those that weren't um, was relatively quite low. And in the age of information technology, this gap has become so much wider. So it's quite clear that the only way to keep pace and ensure better outcomes is to ensure that we are at the absolute leading edge of technological innovation. Because uh, it can become a tool for great prosperity, but if you, you don't board the train, then it widens inequality quite rapidly. Right? So yes, technology is accelerating and it's a train we cannot afford to miss. Now, there are some emerging trends that we're seeing at this point of time, which is that uh, it's always a prediction, right? We don't really know what our workplace would be like 10 years, 20 years from now. A hundred years ago, it was very easy to predict what life would be like 10 years later. But at this point of time, with the rapid pace of innovation, it's extremely difficult to tell what your life would really be like over the next 10 years. Having said that, we can make some predictions. We can predict that globalization is going to be redefined with the stronger emergence of social capitalism. We can predict that digital transformation is going to increase with less reliance on uh, manual work and uh, insurance of greater business continuity in a lot of industries. Uh, the use of an on-demand workforce is going to increase. We can sense a need for healthcare reform since COVID has exposed the vulnerabilities in various uh, countries wherever the gaps lay within their supply chains or in their operations. Uh, and, and there's a need for revamping that in a lot of countries. Uh, the supply chain will fragment and reconfigure based on the needs of the hour. Uh, industries, particularly airlines, retail, hospitality, healthcare, education, construction, technology, uh, will be forced to reinvent. And upskilling and reskilling is going to become a major priority. Uh, there is an expectation that with greater remote, remote work, decentralization, distributed teams, uh, urban transformation is expected. Even the layout of cities can be expected to change um, away from the traditional downtown workplace, business center versus suburb, residential centers, etc. So it can be expected to change to some degree. Uh, rapid innovation will keep businesses afloat. Company culture is going to become a critical competitive advantage in the near future. Uh, extreme distributed workforces will be the norm. The fight for employee retention is now starting to lose economic viability. I'm sure a lot of us have been observing it creeping up on us over the last few years. But now with the shift to an on-demand workforce that we can expect to happen over the next 10 years, this is going to be a losing battle. And companies will adopt work cycles, which is a business methodology that focuses on high-speed project-based work so we gather a set of individuals based on their credentials um, for a particular project, deliver high-speed work, and then disband after. That is the future of work from what we can predict at this point of time. And we have to be prepared to tackle this, right? And a strong foundation of business agility will only help us do that, right? Now, talking about pivots now. So we started this session with talking about pivots, pause then pivot, what does it mean? Now, in a rapidly changing world, the need for a pivot in business strategy is just a question of when and not if it's absolutely inevitable at some point that with this rapidly changing world where everything regarding how we operate with our environment, how we interact with our peers, how we conduct business is changing so quickly, they're changing business strategy is only a question of when and not if. So I'm going to borrow a quote from Eric Rice, who wrote a lean startup, which is, uh, what is a pivot? A pivot is a change in strategy without a change in vision. You cannot have a pivot without a vision. That's just wandering around, right? So pivot is a change in strategy without a change in vision. So to answer the question of now that we're agile and our business is agile, what's next? What's next is being prepared to pivot when the situation demands it, when the market demands it, right? Now I'm going to walk you through a couple of examples of uh, what uh, certain organizations, some organizations have practiced in terms of recent pivots, and recent and not so recent. So I have examples from three different industries to inspire you. The first is in uh, fitness technology. So the Canadian athleisure brand, uh, Lululemon, uh, used to before really only cater to uh, apparel, right, over the last year. So a highly successful organization. 
However, during the COVID lockdown, they made a pretty hard pivot into fitness technology. They acquired the uh, American live stream screen tech uh, business called Mirror, which is essentially a device which looks exactly like a mirror. When it's turned off, it is just placed in your living room or wherever you want it to be, mounted on a wall, looks like an ordinary mirror. But then when you turn it on, then it turns into a screen where a personal trainer on the other side can actually coach you and guide you on your exercises. Or if you prefer, prefer to do you know, any pre-recorded video within a program, then you can load that up in the mirror and use it. And then you turn it off and it goes back to being a mirror. And it was created out of this very clear need. There was hesitance around people resuming work at gyms and working out uh, you know, in a common shared space in our pandemic time. So therefore, uh, Lululemon made a very hard pivot towards moving into fitness technology, and it can only be uh, anticipated this is the start for them. Um, they might very well become a fitness technology company as opposed to only operating in apparel as uh, you know their primary business, because they've seen some excellent feedback and returns there. Now, that's the first example of a very recent pivot. Let me walk you through a couple more. The second is an e-commerce. Now, uh, I'm not sure how many of you have used Groupon, but uh, it's an e-commerce site that allows you to essentially get major discounts on uh, various activities with local businesses. That could be spa treatments, it could be getting a haircut, it could be you know a kayaking ride or a rappelling trip or rock climbing or something of that sort, right? And um, this was started. Groupon started out as a website called The Point which was a fundraising website, wherein people would uh, sign up to donate to a particular fund. And then uh, once that reached a certain number, that is when it would become active and uh, the donations would be received. Now, uh, Groupon started as a site project using that same concept, applying it to local deals. That is once a certain number of individuals, like 20 people, 30 people, signed up to do an activity, then it would unlock a group discount and therefore be available to individuals who otherwise were not connected, did not know each other, right? And that singular project, the Groupon project, overtook the point, that fundraising website, in popularity so greatly that it became the Groupon that we know today, right? Major business pivot, right? And then a third example that I have is that uh, Twitter started out as a website called Audio which was a network where people could find and subscribe to podcasts, right? But when iTunes happened and iTunes began taking over the podcast business, the founders were very concerned that audio would not survive the competition. So after giving the employees about two weeks to come up with new ideas, the company decided to make a drastic change and they moved to the microblogging uh, website that we know today, uh, which was conceived by Jack Dorsey. Uh, so Twitter itself started out as a podcasting platform, not a microblogging platform, and now is pretty much one of the most successful organizations in the world, right? So here are a few examples of business pivots made by certain organizations that could not have been achieved if they did not have the foundations in place of ensuring that they're very aware of the market, ensuring that they know the user very well, ensuring that they're measuring how the user is interacting with their services and products on a real-time basis, right? And there's no reason for us to not be doing that. There's no reason why our community of practice with our product owners, which maybe starts out their week with an analytics dashboard that shows us what are the best performing features that are not performing well, using that information to drive customer behavior for the next iteration, for the next week, for the next month, right? Now, in summary, as we approach the end of this session, I just want to say that um, it's very simple. Uh, we assess where we are in terms of our business agility. We establish the foundations. We address the deviations that we've discussed around data-driven uh, product decisions, et cetera. And then we prepare to pivot. And uh, in conclusion, I want to say that business agility is a means to an end. It is the opportunity. It is the, uh, it is the ability to opportunistically maximize results through increased customer centricity, market awareness, and organizational adaptability. So whatever is the area of improvement for you, please begin targeting it today. Right. And with that, we come to the end of this session. I think we've made good time and we have in fact five minutes left in the meeting. Uh, I uh, send my regards to all of you. Thank you very much for uh, attending this session, though it's the final one of the day. And I look forward with, to interacting with all of you in the lounge after this session. 
uh, please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. My email address and ID is uh, posted here and looking forward to uh, interacting with all of you. Thank you. <laughs>